No. Okay. Uh, no, I better not. Are you sure? I didn't see nothing that big. Maybe, uh, Sandy, I'm going to ask him. Let's start talking now. Okay. Guys, we got through 9-11, correct? Do you need to say how that caught us on the ground? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's where we were. Oh, yeah, this is the fun story. All right, so um, I think Lily told me we were talking about this when we got home last night. Uh, I did mention Zero Dark Thirty. Yeah. Uh, the movie? Yeah. About the female CIA agent and the courier. Okay, so she kept spotting, like, this 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 name uh, and so forth, and they figured out that's what he was because Bin Laden – for years after 9-11 was releasing these videos and it looked like he was in a cave somewhere. Okay, so we were thinking that he was in the mountains here. Okay, so this is after 9-11. Now, first of all, you got two things. You got Al-Qaeda and you got the Taliban. Okay, now the Taliban is who just took back over Afghanistan when we pulled out. Okay, now the Taliban, their sect of Islam is like the Middle Ages, guys. It is it is a dark view of uh, of women, uh, society. It, it is a very strict brand of Islam. Okay, so like I said, the Northern Alliance they didn't want to live like that. They didn't want to live under uh, Islamic rule, and even though they're Muslim, it's like, do you guys want to live uh, under Old Testament law? And the president of the country is a priest. Do you want to live in that country? I don't. We have a secular society. We have secular laws. Now, if all the laws in the Bible were our laws, we would have a very strict society, would we not? I don't want to live there. And neither did the Northern Alliance. And this is the fight in the Middle East over living like that or having some freedom. To live as you want. Okay? And so we're looking for bin Laden here. We can't find him. So Bush is president from 2000 to 2008. And we don't catch him. Bin Laden is in Pakistan. And we are able to trace his courier. So he would get the video from bin Laden. And then take it out of the country. And then send it out to CNN and on the internet. Okay. And so that's how we found where Bin Laden was. And so they sent in SEAL, SEAL, SEAL Team 6 to get it. Okay. And there's a good movie called SEAL Team 6. Okay. Um, and, you know, that whole thing was, uh, was kind of crazy because uh, we Pakistan's our ally, and they didn't, they didn't tell us he was there. They probably knew he was there. Okay. So we didn't tell them we were coming into their airspace to get it. And guys, we had these new stealth helicopters, like they're kind of quiet helicopters, which is weird, right? And uh, the, the compound where he's at has a wall around it, and one of the helicopters' tail hit the wall. And so it, it, it was just, you know, it wasn't able to fly. They weren't going to be able to use that one. So uh, they, they went into the compound. There were women and children in there. Uh, anybody that was deemed as a threat, they put a bullet in it. It was kill or capture Bin Laden. And uh, they went up the stairs, clearing rooms and so forth, got to the, the bedroom upstairs, and Bin Laden was in there with his wife. Bin Laden went for a gun, and he was shot between the eyes. Uh, we took everything we could find in that house, uh, hard drives, computer hard drives. Uh, there was a whole lot of pornography there. Okay, This... Uh, Holy Islamic guy, okay, um, and um, we got the hell out of it, okay. Now, we decided to uh, bury, once we confirmed it was Bin Laden, I uh, decided to bury him at sea. So, um, I forget the name of the ship, um, but they, uh, it was the something Vincent, Carl Vincent, uh, they dumped him into the ocean. So, the, you know, they couldn't have a grave site where he's a martyr and that sort of thing. Okay, so th but that was under Obama. Okay, um, now what happens next? Okay, so we're fighting in Afghanistan from 2001, okay, to 2021. 
Okay, 20 years. In 2003, this guy, Saddam Hussein, still in power. Okay, now who's president? George W. Bush, the father, is the one that defeated Saddam here in Kuwait. Now, George Herbert Walker Bush is a hero in Kuwait. They love George Bush, the dad. So they invite him back for like, you know, a ceremony. You know, they're going to you know laud him with praise and thanks and everything. Well, it's found out that Saddam has hatched an assassination plot against the first Bush president. Well, who's president now? The son. Okay. Now, the son, W. Bush, says that Iraq is violating all the UN agreements that finished the the first war. Selling of oil, that sort of thing. Instead of for food, they're selling it, they're violating all these rules, and they have a relationship with Al-Qaeda. And they are building weapons of mass destruction or are in possession of weapons of mass destruction. Now, in the 1980s, as Iraq tried to build nuclear facilities in their country, Israel flew American-made jets into Iraq and destroyed them, setting back their nuclear program permanently. Keep this in mind for today. Now, so he's violating all these rules. Bush says, we need to get rid of Saddam. He goes to the UN and says, they're violating UN resolutions. We need to take him out. The UN says, no. And Bush said, well, if you're not going to enforce these resolutions, I will. So in 2003, we go back to Iraq. While we're fighting in Afghanistan, we are going to Iraq. Okay. Now, how do you get there? Can you use bases in Saudi Arabia? Can you use bases in Turkey? Can you use bases in Azerbaijan? With permission, but in most cases, no. So this is going to be difficult, but we're able to get troops in country, get machines in country, tanks and everything. And they called it shock and awe. What you're about to see is shock and awe like what we study called Blitzkrieg in World War II, but perfected with cruise missiles, okay? <laughs> Stealth bombers. Guys, I can remember the first Gulf War in 1990. I was in college. I was at my girlfriend's house. The only news network is CNN, the only 24-hour news network. We're sitting on the couch watching Baghdad. All the journalists are on one, the rooftop of one of the hotels in Baghdad as bombs are going off all around them. Because we have smart weapons. We can fire a cruise missile from a thousand miles away and hit a target within three meters. So we're watching this war on TV and, and the, the Iraqis are spraying anti-aircraft fire. Okay, They can't see our bombers. They're stealth. You can't pick them up on radar. But they're not, they're trying. It looks like the 4th of July. Serious. And we're watching this on TV live. It's crazy. 2003, same thing. Now, we are going to kick the crap out of Saddam and his army. Again, this time we're going all the way to Baghdad and north. And as far as the, the, the combat operations went, it went great. A few weeks in, Bush flies onto an aircraft carrier. There's a big banner in the background that says, Mission accomplished. We won. Saddam's on the run. His, his, his troops have taken off their uniforms and fled back into society. They gave up. It's over. What about the weapons of mass destruction? Where are they at? The whole issue. Oh, crap. Now, we knew they had some because we gave them to them in the 80s to use against Iran. And we know he has chemical weapons because he used them against his own people in the north called the Kurds that they didn't like. 
chemical weapons. Okay? We know he's got them. So we get there, we start looking for them, we find empty shelves. I've read a lot about this, guys. A lot of these weapons were really of sarin gas, by the way. One drop of sarin gas would kill all of us, all of us in this room instantly. We would all die, like that. Okay? That stuff is nasty. We gave it to them. Okay, so we know they got it. Now, what was left of it, I mean, it's, it's really interesting to read about this because we knew they had it. They knew they had it. And they were not good at disposing of it, like breaking it down and getting rid of it. So they would, like, bury it. Okay, and then some of it was probably shipped to Syria. Because we know he now has sarin gas because he used it on his own people. Assad. Okay? So, no, there were not large caches of weapons of mass destruction. There were some. Okay, but there were not large caches of it. Yeah. Didn't uh, Bush's Secretary of State, he just died. Colin Powell? Yeah. He got hung out to dry on that pretty hard, didn't he? He went in front of the UN, talked about weapons of mass destruction. Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, this was a preemptive war. Now, in 2003, you asked the average American, should we get rid of Saddam Hussein, free 25 million Iraqis, set them free, help them realize democratic rule, liberty for the Iraqi people? Yeah, like most of the countries, like, yeah, let's get rid of this guy. He's horrible. Okay, right here. Hillary Clinton supported the war. John Kerry supported the war. Now, you may not know who those people are, but they're Democrat, okay? Most people did. Only, like, two people in Congress voted not to use force. So we go. I mean, it's a preemptive war. We've never done this before. Then, mission accomplished, right? Well, you remember when we talked about when the Russians invaded Afghanistan? And all these Muslims from all over the Middle East came to Afghanistan to kill the Russians? And we call them the Mujahideen. Well, guess what's going to happen? The Americans are in Iraq. And people from all over the Middle East are going to flood into Iraq. We're going to call them the insurgency. And they don't wear a uniform. And they're getting weaponized. They're getting weapons from Iran, who hates us. Okay, so they're getting these IEDs, improvised explosive devices. They're using them on the roadside and on roads and so forth. And our Humvees are rolling along, along, and all of a sudden, boom! And our Humvees don't have the type of armor to protect the soldiers in that. And the Iranians are making increasingly better IEDs that are more deadly. And we're starting to see a big insurgency here, and Americans are starting to die. And a lot of them are being maimed. So by 2006, guys, Bush, this war is now unpopular, and so is Bush. Now, you have to understand something. The rules of engagement for our troops, they were fighting this with one hand tied behind their back. Understand this. Our troops were not allowed to do any night searches. So the insurgents knew they could move weapons and so forth at night, not be searched in their places, in their houses and so forth. Women were not allowed to be searched except by American female soldiers. You're not allowed to shoot at somebody that had just laid down an IED and is running away from it. You can't shoot at them. If you catch them putting it in the ground, you can shoot at them. You cannot fire on the insurgency unless they are firing upon you. These are the rules of engagement of American troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. They don't wear a uniform, and you don't know who's good and you don't know who's bad. In 2007, General, uh, 2007, um, General, General David Petraeus writes the book on counterinsurgency. He writes a book on it, how to counter an insurgency, and then he implements it. Bush asked for a surge of troops, 30,000 more troops to go in, change the tactics, allow night searches, be more aggressive. Okay, there's a big fight in Congress over sending 30,000 more troops. Bush gets his way. We get 30,000 more troops. And guess what? We're bringing the insurgency under control. Things were getting better in 2007. 
2008, we got a presidential election year. You got an old Vietnam vet, John McCain, running against this really beautiful, smart, sharp Barack Obama. Okay? And guys, Obama runs for president saying, I'm pulling us out of Iraq. McCain says, I don't have a problem with war in Iraq for the next 100 years. What? What are you talking about? 100 years in Iraq. Let me ask you a question. World War II ended in 1945. Do we still have troops in Italy? Yes. World War II ended in 1945. Do we still have troops in Germany? Yes. yes. Do we have troops in Japan? Yes. yes. That's what McCain was talking about, was establishing a democracy here and, and a friend where we had a military base right and a friend right in the middle of the Middle East. That's what Bush envisioned. That's what McCain envisioned. Obama envisioned, let's get the hell out of there. And we elected him, and he kept his promise. Now, things had improved for the Iraqis, but it wasn't over yet. And so when we pulled out in 2009, the Iraqis were not ready to stand on their own two feet. All those people that were in the Ba'ath Party that used to be with Saddam now start wearing black. And they pledge allegiance to a new caliph named al-Baghdadi, who is establishing a new caliphate in the Middle East, called ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Now, if you go back, Obama called it the ISIL, or the Levant. Which if you go back in Islamic history, you talk about a one, a one Middle East government under religious rule, a, ca a caliphate. You guys studied this before, right? Caliphate, okay? That uh, Baghdadi would do that. Now, Obama also called ISIS the JV. So, yeah, the junior varsity. Okay. So now let me zoom in here a little bit and let's talk about what happens after 2009. While we're still fighting in Afghanistan, okay, I got all the important countries. Afghanistan's over here, okay. Now, in the north, you've got the Kurds, right? Love the Kurds, okay. Now, <laughs> I really do. No, I really do. I, I, I have a I, I have a passion for the Kurds. I you know I do. They're all no, they've been very good to the American to the American soldiers. Okay, listen. Um, so 2009 we pull out. ISIS forms up in here. Okay. Now the goal of ISIS is easy to figure out. All you have to do is read the Quran. Just like if you want to figure out what Adolf Hitler's plan was, read Mein Kampf. It's all in there. It's all in the Quran. And the goal is to bring in Rome, which is the West, bring Rome in, suck them into a fight here, and defeat them, and usher in the end times. One culminating battle for the end times. It's in the Quran. This is the, the caliphate's goal. Okay, we call them the JV. Now, the ISIS strikes out against the Iraqi army. Now, the Iraqi army, like the Taliban today, has American tanks, American artillery, American equipment, because we left it there for them. And as soon as the ISIS broke out against the Iraqi military, you know what the Iraqi military did? They turned tail and ran and left behind the Humvees, the tanks, and the artillery. American equipment that is now falling into the hands of ISIS. And so that makes it a lot easier for ISIS to expand its operations in Syria and Iraq. So it begins to grow. ISIS is no longer the JV people. Now these people are sick. You understand me? They are brutal. I don't know if you know the story of the Yazidis that live in Iraq. They're somewhere between a Christian and a Muslim. These Yazidis, they're peaceful people. Christians that lived in Iraq. These people will be persecuted. They will be murdered. They will be enslaved. Under Islamic law, if you are a Christian, they can kill you or you can pay them and they can enslave you. 
if you pledge allegiance to them. Women are sold as sex slaves, as wives to ISIS. They are raped, they are brutalized. Archaeological sites throughout Iraq will be destroyed by ISIS. Stuff dating back tens of thousands of years. These people are the scourge of the planet. So, what do we do about it? Guys, there's some good news. Okay? Obama says, look, we got to do something. So he starts sending in special forces. Now, while this is going on, when Obama's elected in 2008, he takes office in 2009, his first overseas trip, he goes to Egypt, to Cairo, at American University, and gives a speech. And he talks about beautiful things, like freedom and self-determination of peoples and democracy. He's talking to the Middle East. He's in the Middle East talking about these things. And what you're going to see is what's called the Arab Spring. So before long after that speech, in Tahrir Square in Cairo, there were more than a million people protesting against their dictator, Mubarak. Now, Mubarak is a friend of ours, of the United States. We have a good relationship with Egypt because Egypt normalized relations with Israel. They said, all right, we're going to stop attacking Israel. Okay. All right. No, that's good. That's progress, right? So, so, guys, Mubarak is a bad dude. He's a dictator. He's also sick. So he's eventually, I mean, he's going to die. He's just going to, it's too much stress. Now, he has fleeced the Egyptian people billions of dollars that he's stolen from them. He's not really a good guy, but he's our guy. And the Egyptian military does military exercises with the United States military. Our military and their military have a good relationship. You want to go see the, the, the towers in Giza? Go ahead. You can. It's pretty safe. Yeah, not anymore. Mubarak's out. Now, they're going to hold elections in Egypt. Now, guys, there's no political parties in Egypt. The most organized group in Egypt, when you have a free and open uh, election, the most organized group is a group called the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood, according to some Americans and some scholars, is a terrorist organization. The number two of Al-Qaeda, the surgeon I talked about, Zora Howey, is the number two of Al-Qaeda. He's a founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. But they're the most organized. They get elected to lead Egypt. And the president of Egypt is going to start implementing Sharia law, Islamic law. So in Egypt, where women can read, work, go get jobs, where they don't have to be covered and all that, that starts to change in Egypt pretty quickly. Now, the head of the Egyptian military is like, you know what? No, we are not going to go back to the Middle Ages in Egypt. We are beyond this. And the head of the Egyptian military will overthrow the Muslim Brotherhood government. It's a coup d'etat. Now, under American law, we cannot recognize that new Egyptian government with that military leader. Now, some of us back in the states are like, the army to overthrow the democratically elected government. This is a good thing, right? Obama wasn't happy, but I was. Anyhow, um, so listen. They, they got to hold free elections again, okay? They classify the Muslim Brotherhood as it is, a terrorist organization they cannot run for office. So they hold new elections without the Muslim Brotherhood. The leader of the military wins the election. Now we can recognize them, okay? Now, Egypt is back in good hands, okay? Now, next door, Libya. Okay, remember Muammar Gaddafi? I said that name yesterday. Remember that name, Gaddafi? He's a thug. He's the one that we linked the explosives to the Lockerbie Scotland Can Am flight that killed 200 plus Americans. That guy, right? Yes. yes. Gaddafi. All right, now, listen. When we went into Iraq in 2003 preemptively, looking for weapons of mass destruction and so forth, he's like, holy crap, this Bush guy is freaking, he's crazy. He's starting wars, and we, he didn't even get attacked. 
and 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 Gaddafi says to Bush, he's like, hey Bush, I don't want to be your enemy anymore. I, I don't want to be your enemy. If you guys want to come and see if I'm making weapons of mass destruction, you guys can come in and see, do inspections, whatever you want. I don't want to be your enemy. Because the Bush doctrine after 9-11 was this. You're either with us or you're against us. You're either against terrorism or you're for terrorism. And Gaddafi said, I don't want to be for terrorism anymore. So Gaddafi had kind of like said, hey, I, I want to make amends. But the Arab Spring was happening, guys. People in Libya were rising up against Gaddafi. And he's, yes, he's a thug, he's a dictator. But now he was kind of like working with this dictator guy. You know what I mean? And so we're going to help him. Obama, Hillary Clinton is the Secretary of State at the time. And they are going to use the U.S. Navy to bomb and take out Gaddafi's ability to make war so the rebels, the rebels can defeat Gaddafi. Now, wait a second. Who, who, now, who are these rebels? Who are these people? Are they, like, linked to al-Qaeda? Are they radicals? Are they, like, democratic people that want to live in a secular society without being ruled by religion? This, who are these rebels? Nobody freaking knows. But we're going to help the rebels because they're rising up for democracy. All right? So we're going to take out Gaddafi. You can see it on YouTube. Look him up. He's murdered in the streets of Tripoli. Now, Gaddafi had a lot of weapons. Is he his murderer? Yes. Gaddafi has a lot of weapons. Hang on now, guys. Oh, he's got artillery. He's got missiles. He's got all kinds of stuff. Guns. He's got tons of His army's big. Okay? Now, you've got Benghazi and Tripoli. Tripoli and Benghazi. Okay? Now, so what happens here, guys, today in Libya, it's a failed state. Half the country is controlled by a quasi-government. The, the rest is like the Wild West. It's crazy over there. Okay? Um, my wife was telling me last night, about two years after Benghazi, she, she met these people because my wife's in missions. And there was a missionary that really wanted to go over there. Uh, it, this is like 2004. Uh, I forget what year. It's a couple of years after Benghazi. And um, he was murdered over there. I mean, it was, it's, it, you know, it's, it's lawlessness. It's a failed state. Okay? So what we got was worse than what we had. What we got was worse than what we had. What we got was worse than what we had. ISIS was worse than Saddam Hussein. Yes? This is probably Iraq right now. They have a government. Uh, I don't know the guy's name. Uh, I don't know if Karzai's in charge there, but... Um, they're somewhat stable right now, um, which is good for the Iraqi people. Um, the Iraqi people aren't our enemy. Okay, Look, are you guys follow me here. These mili these are all military dictators. And then you got this guy here. So while Obama's president, we got rid of Mubarak, we got rid of Gaddafi. He wants to get rid of Assad. And you want to know what happened in Benghazi? The CIA was rounding up weapons found from Gaddafi's weapons storage and funneling them to rebels in Syria that wanted to overthrow Assad. Who are these rebels? No, they're not Kurds. They're bad people. They're worse than Assad. You understand? Listen, if Assad falls, what we're going to get is worse than Assad. We know Assad. You know, we know what we have with this guy. When you let the radical, the radicals be in charge like ISIS was, what you're going to have is much worse. So, guys, I've had an about face on this. I think it was wrong to go to Iraq in 2003. That was a mistake. We knew who Saddam was. We knew he was a bad guy. But we had him, we had him trapped. We take him out and get ISIS, this massive insurgency. Take out Gaddafi, we get worse. Take out Mubarak, we get worse. So I, I talked about this when we were electing Trump or Hillary in 2016. Obama's leaving office. I'm like, dude, the new president, whether it's Hillary or Trump, has the ability to stop 
this, removing the sock. Okay, so you still have ISIS when Trump comes in, right? 2016, 2017, ISIS is growing. We're using special forces under Obama to use targets. Now, guys, 200 American special forces with air support can do a lot of damage. Okay, now, but you know who else hates ISIS? Assad, the Kurds, Turkey. And then all of a sudden, Russia opens a naval base in Syria. So you've got the U.S., the Russians, the Syrians, the Kurds, the Turks, and the Iraqis all hate ISIS. This is good, right? And so Trump's like, we're going to freaking get these people. All right? So now we had to, like, actually coordinate with the Russians because they were flying missions in Syria and Iraq, too, we were flying missions. So we're like, hey, guys, don't shoot at each other. We both have the common enemy. Okay. And then the Kurds, which live up here, and I, right here. Okay. Now, these poor people, they're one of the people on this planet that are people without a country. The Iraqis don't want them. The Iranians don't want them. And the Turks hate them. Okay. Now, when we went into Iraq the first time, the Kurds helped us. When we went into Iraq the second time, the Kurds helped us. Now, their fighting force is called the Peshmerga. These guys have been fighting since they were kids. Their whole lives, the women fight, the men fight, the Peshmerga. Okay, and when they started engaging against ISIS, people around the world were like, hey, we need to help the Kurds. And seriously, like American citizens that are civilians, went over there to fight with the Peshmerga. You had an entire biker gang from Belgium with shotguns that flew into northern Iraq to fight alongside the Kurds against ISIS. Like civilians going in there. I mean, I was thinking to myself, like I said, I like these people. I'm like, you know, if I didn't have a family and kids and I was 20 years younger, maybe 15 years younger, I might go over there and freaking kill some ISIS. It's like good fun. Damn. Dude, it's fighting fascism. Okay? These people are the worst of the worst. All right? So, now, since then, we've really limited their ability, ISIS. But, guys, because you have a failed state here, can ISIS set up here? Can ISIS set up in Afghanistan now? They're still a threat. Not like they were. Okay? So their big battle of bringing the West in, bringing Rome in, and the Koran, they're going to have to wait for another caliphate on that one. It could work. We took out Baghdadi. They did win in the West. They did, they but they didn't win. win. Yeah. And Baghdadi is dead. We got him. The caliph. Okay. Trump got him. How do you know how to spell Baghdadi? Is it a Y or an An H. A V. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> How do you spell Baghdad? I thought G H. G H. Bag daddy. Yeah, that's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad daddy. That's probably that's probably. Oh daddy. Bag daddy? Hey, no. Alright. So listen. Guys, no, seriously. Think about, I want you to know because most most Americans don't know this stuff, right? So look, you have military dictators in there that control the radicals in their own country. You follow me? That's why Christians, man, Christians were allowed to exist in these countries for centuries, peacefully, protected by these dictators. Because Christians just wanted to worship Jesus and raise their families and live in peace. They didn't cause problems for the government. The people that cause problems for these governments are the radical Muslims, the radical ones. Okay, so they keep them down under control and then when we have the Arab Spring, guys, we just unleashed that. We unleashed it, which I think was a big mistake. You know? 
So the next time your president wants to get in a war, make sure we're doing it for the right reasons. Make sure that we have a mission that's very specific that we can achieve. And if we don't, we don't. Okay? So that's kind of the moral of the story. So today we're in, you know, this this whole thing, like your parents and I grew up hating the, the, the commie bastards of Russia. And then the then the Cold War ended. And for a few years, it's like we have no enemies. It's great. And then terrorism. Okay, so that's the world that you guys grow up in. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, we have relations with the Iraqi government. They're kind of strange. Uh, we're allies with Saudi Arabia, uh, although most of the people hate us. Uh, their education system, they use what's called Wahhabism. And so Christians, Jews are seen as swine, less than human. That's what they're taught in their schools. Um, so a lot of them hate us. Jordan, we have good relationship with. Uh, Lebanon, pretty good. Uh, Israel, of course, is our uh, one of our closest friends in the world. Uh, behind Britain, probably I would say number two. You can throw Japan, South Korea in there as great allies. Um, certainly the French, the Germans would be on our side in most cases. When we went to Iraq in 2003, guys, the French and the Germans did not send troops. The British did. The Spanish did, and then there was a terrorist attack in Spain, and so Spain pulled out all their troops. Um, Japan actually sent troops to Iraq, just, just in solidarity with the United States. Not very many, but just in solidarity with the United States. Um, it was mostly an American operation, this Iraq war, and Bush became very unpopular for it. I get what he was trying to do, and I, and I appreciate it. I just think we didn't think it through very well. And um, maybe it was a mistake. Um, so anyhow, um, we'll see. Uh, Turkey right now, their leader, they're in NATO. Uh, they're an ally, but their leader, uh, Aragon, um, he's a Aragon. bad dude. Yeah, it's like Ar it's spelled like Aragon. He, he's a bad dude. Um, really uh, trying. Turkey is 99% is Muslim. And it's a secular government. I mean, like, they, secular laws like we have. It's not a Muslim government. And so they're kind of the model you look at and say, hey, you can have a Muslim country that's democratic, but he got elected, and then he started going after his political opponents, killing them and, and stuff. And, uh, yeah, so he's kind of a bad guy. But he's, in, he's our ally, okay? So it's a complicated world, guys, and I hope over the, this semester – as we go through the 20th century, it'll be a less complicated for you to understand uh, and have good good knowledge uh, about how we got to where we are today. That's that's my goal. So on Monday, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a map up of prior to World War One and after World War One, and we'll look at the map of Europe, and then we'll start talking about a little bit of the end of the war, and then move into uh, into some notes. Yes. Good. Congratulations, Adam. Hopefully you're smarter than you were when you came in here a few days ago. They're, um, they're a religious group mostly out.